So my process for writing Dark Chapter was um, just kind of, I guess, sort of instinctive. Um, I mean, there's no guide. I mean, there probably are books on how to write a novel. Um, I don't know if there's books out there on how to write a novel, which are fictional representations of your own real life trauma. Um, anyway, if there were, I didn't read any of those books. So I just kind of went instinctively into it. Um, but I did wait. So my rape happened in 2008. And I, I kind of knew almost right away that as a writer, this was something I had to write about. You couldn't live through anything that momentous and life changing and not try to address it in your art. Um, but I also knew I wasn't really ready to write about it. Um, so, you know, because I had this trial of, of my rapist that I had to go through and I had to, um, you know, so I had to get through the whole legal process. Then I also had to, you know, put my life back together. Right. So writing the novel then, I, I'm like, this is not going to be kind of good for my mental health to be delving into it, especially when it was so raw and fresh. So I had to wait about five and a half years before I started um, feeling like I was in a place where I could write it. Um, and I actually enrolled in a creative writing program. I did my master's at Goldsmiths. Um, and having that sort of structure in place um, was really helpful because on one hand, it allowed me to really focus more on the craft and find a community of other writers. Um, which put this whole other sort of scaffolding around the project of writing about my own trauma, right? So, so I think if I'd gone into it kind of completely on my own, and I know other authors that have done that and other survivors, um, I, I would have found it quite isolating. Because, um, you know, writing at the end of the day is an isolating art, right? Um, it's the irony of creating something that, you know, thousands of people could read, millions maybe, but, um, but also the process of creating it is pretty much just you, and your computer or you and you know a piece of paper and a pen right so in some ways writing about my trauma in that very isolated way was really challenging emotionally um you know there was it, so there was that you had to develop the discipline of you know if you're going to write a novel you have to write x number of words a day otherwise you're never going to get the material um down to create to like hone into a novel um so that meant you know aiming to write a thousand words a day um, and at the time I'd kind of stopped other work. I was lucky enough to have earned enough money in other jobs prior to then to be like, okay, I'm going to dedicate, you know, a year or two years, um, to writing this novel. So I enrolled in the creative writing course full time and I really was just focused on writing. Um, so, um, every day I was like, I'm going to write a thousand words every day. And that pretty much meant trying to be in front of my computer by nine o'clock. Um, and you know, I am a pretty fast writer. So a thousand words, especially if you're not trying to polish it actually doesn't take very long. Um, so there was a way of saying, if you, once you broke it down into those chunks saying like, okay, by 10, 30, 11, if I'm really focused by 10, 30, 11, I'm done with those a thousand words. So I actually can go out and do whatever hell I want. Right. Generally reading or like kind of filling up the artistic well in some other way. Um, generally, I wasn't actually that disciplined in the sense that it's, a lot of times it was like 3 p.m. by the time I, found, I got around to writing. So, um, you know, I still struggle because in some ways, like the best thing is if you kind of knock a thousand words out in the morning and then you can go. But um, it doesn't always work like that. But, you know, obviously you have to keep at it, you know, for the most part every day. Um, so I did it and eventually I wrote about 143,000 words, um, which is much longer than the actual published novel. And I sent that to an agent who was interested and she signed me on. Um, and uh, I mean, you would have thought everything kind of went smoothly from there, but it didn't. I ran into a lot of other issues, um, making it into book form. Eventually got cut down to 110,000 um, by my British publisher. Uh, there was a lot of other stuff I wanted to keep. Um, so I wasn't really happy about that creative process of editing, um, but whatever, <laughs> eventually it made it into book form. But I suppose for me, you know, having that, time and space where it was about like a good two years where I was really just focused on the writing itself really allowed me to delve into the, the different creative aspects and obviously for me dark chapters written from the point of view of both Vivian the victim who's very much based on me and Johnny the perpetrator who is maybe sort of my fictional imagining or reimagining of who my actual stranger rapist was right so I didn't know him in real life so there was this big question mark about like, who is this person that, you know, followed me in a park and decided to be incredibly violent and rape me? Um, and so I only ever knew that, I mean, I never actually knew that person, but I only ever encountered that person for, you know, a half hour on a Saturday afternoon, but that person changed the rest of my life. Um, so that big kind of question of who is this person and how did he get to be the way he is at the age of 15, because he was a very young rapist, um, was sort of what fired me to to write that 
novel and drove me through the whole writing process. Um, so in terms of breaking it down between the two characters, Dark Chapters alternates between the point of view of Vivian and Johnny, and even though their lives will really only cross once and then again in a trial, um, you know, you see both of their lives from kind of their young childhood growing up towards that moment. And they live very different lives. Vivian's very similar to me. So she's kind of from a middle-class American background, Asian American background, um, went to a good school, always wanted to travel. And it's when she's in Belfast on a hike on her own because she loves nature that she encounters Johnny. And then Johnny's, you know, a traveler, um, an Irish traveler who isn't from a family that has a huge amount of resources and they move around and they're very much marginalized by the rest of Irish society. Um, so he has a, he doesn't have access to a lot of the opportunities that Vivian has, right? So I kind of wanted to look at how those different experiences of living on the margins and Vivian being Asian American is also somebody who lives on the margins just in a quite different way, um, how that kind of intersects with the experience of being a, a survivor or victim um, or a perpetrator and how society then decides to create their own images um, and their own narratives around these two people who actually are human beings, right? And they aren't just stock figures um, in, a, in a drama that we think we know. Um, so being able to bounce back and forth between their two perspectives was actually really important for me creatively um, because when I was writing Vivian's sections, that was reliving the worst point of my life, right? Um, and if I had to do an entire two years of writing just that, I think it would have been really bad for my mental health, but I could always got, bounce back to Johnny's point of view. And fine, he doesn't have the greatest life, but being able to delve into that creative process of creating a whole other character, one who's very different from me and trying to see things in life from his perspective was in its own way quite productive for me um, creatively and also, I suppose, kind of personally. Um, so, it, you know, in, in some ways there's, and Johnny's, you know, it, because of his character, he's maybe, he's constrained because he doesn't have a lot of opportunities, but, you know, it's, it's a very different kind of upbringing and mindset that he has. And that's sort of, you know, issues of toxic masculinity in there. He's exposed to porn at an early age. So all that kind of perspective, which is not something I've had in my own lived experience, um, was something I could explore through the writing. And so in that sense, it was quite kind of productive for me. Um, so, and then, so being able to bounce back and forth between those two characters was really kind of important to have that um, I guess, creative freedom in some ways, um, because if I tried to write it strictly as a memoir where it's just from my point of view, or if I tried to write it strictly as Vivian's point of view, I think it would have been too heavy emotionally for me. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, there's always more to say, right? Um, so Dark Chapter is about like 400 pages, so that's a pretty hefty volume in itself. Um, but, you know, it, it's not like the process of recovery or the process of being a survivor ends once you've got it published into book form, right? Um, and it certainly didn't end in terms of the narrative of Dark Chapter. I mean, it, it kind of wraps up a little bit after the trial ends, right? Um, and for me, and I, this is where I had a lot of kind of um, struggles with my editor, I, you know, I kept on insisting like, we need to show more of her life after the trial because it's not fine. That's the traditional Hollywood narrative. A crime is committed, you know, justice is achieved or not achieved. And like, that's, that's where the film ends, right? But, you know, that's not real life, right? I mean, real life is, you know, for me, it was like once the legal process was over and my perpetrator was in jail, was, you know, sentenced and um, put into prison, it's not like my life went back to normal and I was like, everything was happy and rosy, right? You know, it actually it was more of a struggle after that because the traditional narrative was, was, was it was over in that sense right um and you're so you're thinking like i've done everything he, he's in prison now but why is my life still shit right so um you know i was unemployed i couldn't find a job for two and a half years i ended up having to leave london and move to the middle east um to get a job in film um and so you know for me it's very important to show like the longer tale of survivorhoods, you know, after the immediate few years, after the legal process, knowing, knowing, first of all, that quite a lot of survivors and victims don't actually get a legal process. So they don't have the benefit of their perpetrator being convicted. Um, so, you know, what is it, what does recovery look like in the long term, right? Um, so I think that's quite important to, to cover. And I couldn't cover that all in dark chapter, right? Um, and it's still, so part of my engagement with the media in terms of like continuing to write pieces, um, or continuing to have a public voice around this issue is to demonstrate that long tail um, of recovery, right? Uh, and I think that's quite important because, you know, as we know, people become victims every day, right? And so for them to know that five years down the line, you know, you can get a book, you can start writing a book and a few, few years down the line, you can get a book published or one day you might become a mother, you know, end up having your own family, which has happened to me like that, 
kind of more optimistic message is really important to put out there. Um, while at the same time, we need to emphasize kind of the negative aspects of the trauma in the first place and why it even happens. Um, so yeah, so for me, like, yeah, fine. I did Dark Chapter, um, publicized the hell out of it, right? Gave lots of talks about it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a book I'm proud of. I don't particularly feel like reading it again. Um, you know, I, there's an audiobook recording of it, which is 11 hours long. Like, I'm not listening to that. Like, I've, you know, I've spent enough hours of my life on that book. Like, I don't need to listen to the audiobook recording. Um, so for me as an artist, I'm kind of like, it, it's done. It's in book form. It's dusted. But, uh, you know, as an artist, obviously, there's other stories I want to tell. Um, some of which might, might address the longer term aspect of recovery and some of it, which may also address like the larger issues um, surrounding sexual violence and sexual um uh, coercion, right? Um, so I wrote um, Complicit, which was my next book. Um, and I started that actually the year after Dark Chapter came out. And for me, again, it was like kind of the experience of, you know, I, I've lived through this. I've, I once worked in the film industry. And then the same autumn that um, Dark Chapter came out in the States, the Weinstein allegations um, went public. So suddenly you had this whole outpouring of, of people talking about their experiences in the film industry um, and very high level perpetrators who were allowed to continue doing what they did for years and decades, right? Um, so part of me was like, I don't really feel like writing about this again. I mean, like, obviously I was very engaged in like everything that was happening, um, but I wasn't actually thinking of writing a novel about it until my agent at the time said, well, you know, you are probably well-placed to write about this since you once worked in film and you're an actual survivor as well. Um, so uh, for me, I thought about like, how can I write about this in a way that is um, interesting to me? As somebody who's already written a book on sexual violence, how can I write about this in a way that um, isn't just sort of a repeat, right? Um, so I kind of structured Complicit as a suspense novel where somebody 10 years on from her trauma is contacted by a journalist about this producer she once worked with, right? And so that kind of reflected where I was at the time because, you know, actually 2018 um, and my rape happened in 2008. So I had 10 years on, you know, by that point it was 10 years on from my trauma and my perspective on it had shifted a bit. And my experience with the media around this issue had obviously, you know, grown in those years. So a lot of the thoughts I had about how the media treats this issue and how they treat survivors and victims and, and perpetrators um, went into complicit, right? Um, plus I was also, you know, my film career ended or my film producing career ended after my rape. Um, and I've never gone back to producing just because I couldn't figure out a way back in. Um, so that sense of loss I had emotionally and professionally about that career that ended also went into complicit, right? So, um, but you know, for me artistically, I was I was using a slime, you know, is it a different genre? I don't know, we can have the whole discussion about genre, but like it, you know, that whole trope of somebody with a story to tell who's contacted by a journalist is not is not brand new. I mean, we've seen that before, right? So how do I use that trope slash formula? and work with it in different ways to make it kind of sort of surprising or not surprising, but use it as a way to kind of do a deep dive into the film industry. Um, so that's kind of what drove Complicit. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's not out yet. It'll, well, it'll come out very soon this summer. So I've had to adapt it into a screenplay and that whole process of then taking a book I've already written and turn it into another medium, again, is artistically quite interesting for me, but emotionally at this point, I'm like, well, I'm really, I don't need to be revisiting Dark Chapter again, right? I'm really familiar with this material and it's, is it doing anything new for me emotionally? And actually it sort of still is in some ways because every time you revisit that same material but through a different medium, you have a different perspective on it. Um, so, and, and it's, it's interesting because my producer said, well, you know, a lot of screenwriters are really precious about this material. And since this is, you know, your life experience, like you actually aren't that precious about it. Um, and I'm like, well, no, I am precious about it. Like I know what I will do in terms of working on the screenplay and its representation of the character and the issue and what I don't want to do because ideologically I don't believe in it. But I also feel like I've, I've said my bit in the novel. The novel is probably my most complete statement on that, that version of the story. And this is a different version, but I don't feel, you know, it's, I don't feel like I need to own every single piece of the page. Like if other people want to kind of contribute to that process and film as a collaborative medium, much more so than writing novels, then that's fine, right? So for me professionally, obviously it's really important. And from a craft perspective as a writer, I'm learning a lot about writing screenplay, but it's not, you know, I'm not as kind of personally precious about the material because I've already written the novel about it, right? So, um, so that's been interesting for me. And then, one final thing to say about that is, um, you know, when you're talking about screenplays and you have a main character, 
you know, the, one of the big flaws that you can find in the screenplay is that the main character comes off as being really passive, right? So things happen to her as opposed to her making decisions and driving the action, right? And driving the plot. So, okay, when we're talking about rape and sexual assault, like I feel like, you know, I was raped by this person and then I had to go through this entire process with, you know, the police and, uh, you know, medical like examiners and all that sort of thing. Um, and then the, the criminal prosecution service. And I felt very much passive in that whole situation, right? Which is kind of one of the ways in which the aftermath of trauma can continue to be traumatizing for the victim if you have to go through these sort of impersonal public systems, right? Um, so I was like, okay, well, how do, how do I now make her character like active as opposed to passive, right? Um, so that was interesting for me to actually ponder. And then the more I thought about it, the more I was like, well, actually I wasn't, even though I felt passive at the time, I was making decisions, right? Um, they were just decisions so kind of rooted in my own like attitude and character that it didn't occur to me that there were always options, right? So I was like, well, of course I'm gonna, you know, go through the entire process with the police. And of course I'm gonna go through with the trial. Um, and, you know, I remember writing an email to all of my friends telling them quite plainly what had happened. And this was a few weeks after the assaults because I was like, well, there's no other way for me to like convey what happened to me and like writing is my best medium. So I'm just gonna send them an email. Um, and, you know, lots of other victims wouldn't have done that, right? Um, but for me, it just didn't even occur to me. It's like there was an option to not do it, right? Because I'm like, this is the best way to tell people, right? Um, so it kind of made me realize, like, actually, I had been taking decision, making decisions and, you know, choosing to be active in certain ways at the time in how I wanted to approach my trauma and the way people perceived uh, my trauma. But at the time, it didn't occur to me that I was actually, like, driving that forward that, that I felt very passive. So it, actually writing the screenplay allowed me to reframe my own understanding of how I was acting at the time. I mean, I think any thing I did that involved speaking out about my rape was a way of taking back the narrative. And for me, again, I sort of had the narrative taken from me from the very beginning, as I think is the case with many victims, um, because you know, I reported my rape right away to the police. Um, so they kind of came in and I did the entire, had to tell them what happened. And then it had to go through the whole forensic exam, which was awful. And, and that's in the novel. And then they said, well, how would you describe yourself? And how would you describe your attacker? Because we need to put this out in the news, right? Um, so that, that very day kind of, it came out on the news that police were looking for people that had any understanding or had maybe witnessed the two of us um, in the park. Because obviously we had sort of this weird conversation in the park before he followed me. Um, yeah, so, so from that very day it happened, you know, that was a whole other news media narrative that was being created about my rape. Um, and I wasn't really that conscious of it just because I was going through like the immediate aftermath of the entire police procedure, had to fly back to London the next day, I had a film premiere to go to that day, um, which I insisted on going to because I didn't want that to be taken away from me. Um, you know, I, as a, you know, I was very dedicated to my film career and this was our first Leicester Square premiere. So it was the next day after my rape and I'm like, I'm going to this, right? Like I got the dress from the designer, like I bought concealer on the planes. So I'm gonna like cover up all my bruises. Um, and that, um, again, that was a choice I made. And it, to me, it didn't think, I didn't, it didn't occur to me to do anything otherwise. So I felt passive in that situation, but that was an active choice I made. Um, but then the next day, it really it, kind of everything hit me because I, the police were back onto me about how to get more photographs of the bruises and stuff. And then that's when I Googled, I sat down and I Googled rape West Belfast and I saw this entire stream of news stories about my rape. And, and also that morning or maybe, yeah, that morning there had been like a half hour chat show in Northern Ireland about my rape, right? And what what did it mean that, you know, a, a, a visitor to Belfast was brutally raped in a park, right? Um, what did that mean for the safety of Belfast and all that kind of stuff, right? So it was just entire, so all these people were, were calling in saying like, oh, I know that park, it's not safe and blah, blah, blah. And Lord Mayor of Belfast called in and said, oh, I still think Belfast is a safe city. My heart goes out to that, you know, um, to that victim. Um, and I remember the presenter asking her, oh, have you heard anything about the victim? Like, how is she doing? And he's like, oh, I haven't been in touch, but I will be getting in touch with her soon to send her my best which you never did, um, of course, right? But I, you know, it was just really weird. I was listening to this in my flat, people talking about me that had no idea who I was, like complete strangers. And so I just remember thinking like, this is so weird that all these people are talking about my rape, but you know, there was no space in this at all in this dialogue for my voice, right? 
Um, and obviously I wasn't in any state at that point to be making public statements about my rape, but I just remember thinking like that complete elision of the victim's identity and her ability to speak out and her voice was incredibly bizarre, right? Um, and incredibly in dehumanizing for me, right? Um, in some ways. Um, and so there had been, a, you know, a, a lady who's daughter had been murdered, raped and murdered in that same park four, day, four years prior to mine, which is one of the reasons it was such a big news story in Northern Ireland. Um, so she called into that radio station and, and she said, oh, you know, my heart goes out to that wee Chinese girl because her life is now ruined. Um, so I remember hearing that and thinking like, oh, she's described me as a wee Chinese girl, all right? Um, but then also like, oh, right, she just said my life was ruined and she does not know me and she's not me. And like, is that a harmful, yeah, even though it came from a place of sympathy, is that actually, actually kind of a harmful thing to say? Um, because I thought, you know, okay, I am here listening to this, right? And then there are other women listening to this and men who probably themselves are also victims and people who sometime in the future, may be raped and yeah may remember this news story and think okay well my life is now ruined because i've been raped so i just remember thinking like okay well that is maybe a narrative we need to change right um so it, it stuck at the back of my mind that i'm like okay that i am not okay with the fact that like all these conversations were happening and yet my voice was kind of erased um and so i didn't actively do anything well i say again i didn't actively do anything about it but i, I wrote a lot about it and then um, I wrote an essay which got um, published in, it was a kind of a self-published volume of, of women's stories. So that came out three and a half years after the assault. And it wasn't, it didn't have a traditional publisher. So it wasn't like a very big um, kind of public thing, but um, some journalists in Northern Ireland or in Ireland got wind of it. So they interviewed me. And so suddenly, you know, I was being asked to do interviews on Northern Irish radio. Um, and again, it was it was really daunting, you know, because I think any media experience, any media interaction is is quite scary, but um, certainly for a victim. But then I also remember thinking, like, well, I mean, at the time I was living in the Middle East, so I was like, well, I don't know anyone in Northern Ireland, so if I come out sounding as an idiot, no one I know is going to hear that, right? Um, and then also it's like, well, what is the larger benefit of me speaking out because this is a story that people might have remembered and they might have I might have just gone down in history as uh, that nameless Chinese girl who was raped but I'm like I actually am being given an opportunity to speak here and to speak from my own experience about a story that other people know about so yeah sure I'm, I'll do the interview right so so I did a few interviews like that and that was my first experience with the media and again it was terrifying but you know I, I never listened back to my interviews most of the time and I and like I was just like well all right I've done it Maybe it did some good. I don't know, right? Um, I'm gonna move on with my life. Um, and then gradually, you know, then I wrote the book. Um, and in the process of writing the book, I started writing think pieces about it. So, um, some, you know, I had a few articles in the Huffington Post. So that was like kind of the beginning of my publicly speaking out about it. And it was all about trying to reclaim that narrative and trying to center the survivor or the victim's voice in the narrative that we see. Um, because, you know, as you know, um, as many people know, I mean, rape and sexual violence, it's, it's, it's in the Bible, it's in Greek mythology, it's, it's in so many of the narratives that surround us, um, but oftentimes, most of the times, those narratives aren't written by victims or survivors, so if you're going to talk about this issue so much, like, actually, we need to be hearing about the actual people who are the most affected by that issue for it to be an authentic representation and to be something that's not damaging, really, you know, so... Um, yeah, so everything I've done since then in my writing, my activism is about reclaiming that narrative and centering the survivor's voice. I started Clear Lines, which is a festival that provided a platform for art about this issue to be um, seen and heard um, and engaged with. And most of the art that I chose is all kind of done by survivors themselves, like yourself. Um, and because I started realizing, well, you know, there's a lot of work being done about this, a lot of really good artistic work by survivors and especially at the time this 2015 like you know nobody wanted to hear about these issues but like you know it's a life-changing experience it's a trauma that needs to be spoken about and learned about in the proper way um and yet also there are ways of approaching it that are creative that are entertaining that are actually even humorous um that affirm life um and those those kinds of narratives are what I wanted to to portray in some ways not you know not the standard thing where like I was raped and my life is better right you know it's like that the reality of that experience and the reality the reality of like slowly trying to recover your life 
and find a better life afterwards is something that can happen. But you know that we need to see that in narratives, right? You know, um, in public narratives. So um, yeah, and like now it's you know 2022, and obviously hashtag Me Too has happened, and there's a lot of stuff about you know, there's Me Too narratives all over the place, right? Um, some are good, most of them are actually relatively good, I think. So um, that sort of capacity for creativity um, that people have, that survivors have, I think needs to be celebrated. Um, so yeah, and like you're a perfect example, Una, and I can think of like loads more of really amazing art that's not just grim, right? Um, that is about celebrating life in the world um, that is being created that needs to be seen, you know, and engaged with. So what makes my heart sing? Um, I mean, the, the go-to answer would be nature. Um, so, I mean, I now live in the countryside. I lived in urban like cities for you know most of my life. Um, but yeah, I mean, just being able to go for a walk. And so there are, there's very few situations where going for a walk and spending some time in nature on my own doesn't somehow alleviate the pain. Um, now, obviously the irony was that my rape happened when I was on a hike on my own, right? So for years, for a very long time, you know, the trauma and the PTSD was very much associated and triggered by being in nature on my own. So that was a um, really unfortunate situation. And I had to work really hard to reclaim being able to hike on my own, but I, I did. Um, that's kind of towards the end of Dark Chapter, that, that um, episode. And so I um, was able to do that and now I can go for hikes on my own and that's great. Um, but being able to have that connection with nature um, does really kind of help ground you um, and, and make you realize just the beauty of the world, right? Um, I mean, it's springtime now and we've had what felt like a really long cold winter. And then suddenly the fact that there's flowers coming out of the ground and every day I go, for, if I go for a walk every day, there'll be more flowers, right? You know, um, so like that is, um, that's, that's pretty amazing if you think about it, right? Um, so. Yeah, I mean, nature um, does a lot for me, um, but obviously art as well. Um, so uh, if I'm really feeling down, like one of those days where I don't feel like getting out of bed, um, I will probably watch a Pixar film um, because, you know, Pixar films are just incredibly entertaining, but also for the most part, you know, really get you right here <laughs> um, and and somehow touch these sorts of like kind of human nerves, but from a child, kind of from a child friendly perspective. Um, uh, and obviously, you know, there is a lot of incredible art being made about this experience of being a victim and, and ultimately a survivor. Um, so, I mean, since I'm a writer, I'll recommend a few books. Um, After Silence by Nancy Venable Rain is a memoir um, written about a woman who was somebody broke into her home and, and raped her, right? Um, and, and she was... Uh, 39 at the time. Um, so, you know, she'd had her whole life and it was going a certain way and then this happened. So that whole um, experience, I think she writes about very perceptively. Um, and and she all, all, you know, she's a writer, so she herself was trying to create art about it afterwards. And some of the art was just like terrible that she created, right? Um, and, and she would, you know, she, uh, she did this entire series of, I think, like paintings and drawings that were supposed to represent her experience and her friends were like, you know, this is not good, right? You know, um, so that never ended up, she never ended up continuing with that, but it was about how did she use art to try to make sense of this? And then ultimately she ended up writing a memoir, which I know has touched like many people out there. Um, and so I was in my own life, like probably about two or three years after the assault, I was visiting my best friend in New England. Um, she lives in a small New England town and I was just at her library. And there was a whole, you know, you know, when libraries try to get rid of books, they sell them for like, you know, 10p or something like that, right? So there was some books that they were just trying to get rid of, secondhand books that they were selling. And I came across that book and I'd never come across it before. So I was like, oh, right. Okay, there's a book about a woman who's yeah. raped and it's about her recovery. I'm like, I guess I'll buy this and read it. So it was almost like serendipity me coming across that book. But, you know, for anyone who's an artist, like, you know that, I mean, yeah, it's serendipity, but that is how so much of what we do in our lives in terms of creating art is, is inspired by serendipity, right? Um, so I read it and, it and it was really helpful for me because I remember at the time it was only a year or so after my assault. So being able to read something written by a woman many years after her assaults allowed me to realize like, okay, no, it, it is possible to recover and have another kind of life, even though I was in the middle of this kind of sort of fairly terrible aftermath. I'm like, okay, somewhere down the line, a few years down the line, it's not going to be as bad. So that was kind of a good kind of beacon that was shown to me just through being able to read that book. Um, aftermath by Susan Bryson is also incredibly good. Um, she is a philosopher. Um, so she does delve into kind of academic philosophy as well, but it's also just bookended by her own 
her own personal experience of again being followed by a stranger when she was on a run and and raped. Um, I'm aware of the fact that these are all kind of stranger rape narratives, um, and uh, you know, obviously, there's many other forms of trauma. But for me, as a victim of stranger rape, those two books were really useful. Um, tied in with nature, there's travel, right? So for me, like I've always loved traveling, right? And that's kind of if you were to talk about me as a character in a screenplay, like that's my through line. I like traveling, right? And um, they're like, I love just being able to show up in a foreign country and travel on my own and like not really necessarily speak the language and have to completely rely on my own ability to read maps and all that kind of stuff. Like that's, that's I get a huge joy out of doing that. Um, it doesn't happen so much anymore because of COVID and like I've got a toddler, so that's different. But that that absolute freedom of being able to travel somewhere new is like, kind of amazing right so for me in my own recovery and obviously again my rape happened when I was in a foreign country right um so my own recovery was very much about can I travel again on my own right um so uh eventually I was able to right um and I was able I couldn't find a job in London so I moved to the Middle East so again that's like traveling in a different way um but knowing that there's always another place you can go to and start new or another place you can go to and experience the thrill of a new place um is has always been like really comforting as a thought to me I mean now I'm quite sad that I can't travel in the same way but I think for and it's going to be different for other people or it might be some people who hate traveling but for me if I ever got really down I'd know you know just like read a travel guide book and be like oh there's these amazing places I could travel to and you know I just have to book a flight to get there right um again you know you need to have money to be able to do that and I always I did always travel like quite um close to the ground and like on very tight budgets but the fact that there's a whole world out there to explore is always something that I like reminding myself about um and you know I wasn't in a coercive relationship but the aftermath of the trauma certainly felt quite limiting and imprisoning um so for a good you know three years after the assault like I you know the first year I hardly ever left my apartment um but like you know for a good three years I kind of felt like this life I'd had before and that whole world out there was like completely constrained and I couldn't go out and travel in the same way um but being able to be reminded that there were places out there and that one day I might be able to travel someplace I might be able to go to Iceland one day, which I still haven't done, you know, or I might be able to, you know, hike the Inca Trail one day, also still haven't done. But those are always, you know, um, really inspiring thoughts that there's a whole world out there to explore and find maybe the situation you're in now isn't great, but somewhere down the line, you'll be in a situation where you can explore that world. Um, and there's always new things to, to learn and you know, new wonders to experience.